Can you hear me? Is this thing on? Tap, tap, tap. Um, I don't know why I ask that every time. It obviously works. Um, shall we start the next presentation a full two minutes early? <sighs> I know, I know. It's risky, isn't it? Um, okay, so uh, I'll just let people take their seats and stuff like that. Hopefully, um, if you've been watching the Selenium project at all, you'll have seen the contributions that Jim Evans has been making. Um, he came out of nowhere, as far as I was concerned, and took over the ownership of the IE driver. Um, he took my terrible, terrible code and transformed it into something beautiful and nice. Um, that's actually a direct quote from someone, rather than me just being complimentary. Um, he claims not to be a C++ developer, um, and so I'll take his word for it. He's also the maintainer of the c -sharp bindings for the Selenium WebDriver APIs, um, and he's going to tell us about the experiences he's had uh, working on the IE driver. So thank you, Jim. All right, and thank you, Simon. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Evans, and the title of this talk, in case you think you're in the right place, is uh, Building a Driver, Lessons Learned from uh, Developing the Internet Explorer Driver. Um, or with uh, all possible apologies to both Stanley Kubrick and Peter Sellers, how I learned to stop worrying and love Internet Explorer. Sort of. Oh, by the way, feel free to laugh. This is, we're going to have a little, we're going to try to have a good time here, okay? This is, this is, this is fun. Um, as Simon said, who am I? My name is Jim Evans, uh, and I'm a rock star. Uh, not a rock star developer, an actual rock star. You can see iTunes there with one of my albums in it. Uh, and I think really by way of introduction, that's really all you need to know. Um, and I'll happily be the second person today in this room to sh show this slide. Uh, the over-under on how many people will show this very slide today is, I think, sitting at three. So if you had three in the pool, then you're getting close. Um, so a little history and some housekeeping. Uh, I work for Salesforce.com uh, as a quality engineer. We use Selenium fairly extensively in our testing of our products. And now that I've told you where I work, I can take this vest off uh, since I told my... Uh, that I told my colleagues I would, I would wear, and I'll just put it over here so you guys can continue to see it. No, I'm going to keep the t-shirt on because nobody wants to see that. Um, I've been part of the Selenium uh, WebDriver project specifically since uh, December of 2009, uh, and I started by completing the .NET bindings, the bindings for the .NET languages. Um, why I got involved in the project is a story for another time. If, if you're interested, that, that interested in it, buy me a pint at the pub and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, but as I started working on the .NET bindings, uh, and as I started working with the project, I got, I got kind of fed up with uh, the limitations of the IE driver as it was currently implemented at that time. Uh, you could only run a single instance of IE at a time. Uh, if you were work working on Vista or, or, IE se or Windows 7 uh, later on, you had to elevate in order to be able to use it. Um, so back in August of 2010, uh, I started looking at... Um, what it would take to rewrite the IE driver and make it a little bit more, uh, more usable. And um, uh, that effort landed in the trunk in, uh, in December of 2010, and it's been in that state ever since. Uh, now, a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, a lot of people have contributed code uh, to the native code of the IE driver. Um, I'm responsible for most of the architecture and the, most of the code that's in there, but Bear with me, I'm a little uncomfortable talking about things I've done, and, and I don't like using, so if you'll indulge me, I'll say we instead of I when we're talking about the IE driver, but um, as a rule of thumb, if you think something was good and we made a good choice about the architecture, think of that as a team effort and that the team made a good decision. If you think it was a bad decision or you had a bad, a bad experience with it, I'll take the blame for that. You can blame me personally. Um, I'm also going to talk in very general terms today in terms of the lessons that I, that I learned in doing that. Um, so there will be exceptions to almost everything that we talk about. Uh, and as far as uh, what we're, how we're going to approach it today, uh, there are five big lessons that I want you to take away here. Well, six if you live in a trailer park, but let's not worry about that right now. So uh, with that said, on to our first lesson. And the first lesson is to be language independent for browser-specific things. Believe it or not, there are people who do not want to install your pet language runtime to be able to run, the, to drive a given browser. Uh, there are .NET shops that have a fundamental dislike of running any Java code anywhere. They just don't want to do it, for whatever reason. It may be misguided, but that's the way it is. 
Uh, there are Ruby shops that don't want to run Python, Python shops that don't want to run Ruby. So um, you got to take that into account when you're, when you're building a driver for a specific browser. Um, additionally, for desktop browsers anyway, uh, you got to remember that WebDriver or Selenium has to work cross-platform to, to, in order to be effective. And what that means is that you got to pay attention to Windows. You can't just ignore it. As much as some of us would really like to ignore Windows and pretend it doesn't exist, you have to take it into account. Um, and as far as language choices goes, Windows doesn't come with any of the language runtimes installed on it by default. Uh, it doesn't come with Python, Ruby, Java. It doesn't even really come with .NET, although .NET started to ship with uh, Vista and higher, but then it's only .NET 3.0. Um, so you still have to worry about it. And on top of that, .NET's not cross-platform, so it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to build a driver for a browser in, uh, in, in, in a .NET language. Uh, much as I would like to say that Mono is cross-platform, it, it, it's got some limitations of its own. Um, so what does that leave for things that you can reliably use? That leaves C++ and JavaScript, pretty much, because you're dealing with browsers, you've got JavaScript, and C++ can be compiled to almost any uh, C or C++ can be compiled to the native platform that you're working on. Now, pure JavaScript implementations have challenges of their own, shall we say. And uh, I'll talk about a little bit more about those a little later on. Um, but so choosing C or C++ means that you're compiling to a native uh, DLL, dynamically loadable library. That's a DLL on Windows, a shared object file on, on Linux, uh, and so on, um, usually. Or compiling to an executable, which leads me to probably what the most controversial lesson that I'm going to say today, because I know some people who use these drivers have, a, have, a, um, uh, uh, have some challenges with this, or so I've been told, but lesson 1A is distribute a standalone executable. Don't distribute it as a shared library. Go ahead and build the executable file. And you can see here, there's the diagram of the basic uh, uh, architecture of what, a, what, 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 what that looks like. Um, now, why would I say that? Because one of the guiding principles of the WebDriver project, the Selenium project, is being able to do an X copy deploy. And by that I mean, you don't have to run an installer, you don't have to elevate on Windows, you don't have to sudo on, on Linux. You can just copy the files over and they'll run fine. Um, standalone executables really help fulfill this. Um, you know, in, in a little aside, a little history story, uh, when we first created the, 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 the I, current version of the IE driver and the .NET bindings, uh, does anybody remember that? Did anybody use it a year ago right after it landed? I know some of the guys over there did. Um, what we did was, we, when, when, you, when you went to run the .NET bindings, um, you had to make sure that the native code DLL was in the same folder, the same directory as, uh, as your assembly that you were actually running with, with uh, Selenium assembly. And getting that deployed was a real challenge. Uh, a lot, I can't count the number of times on the mailing list or on the IRC channel that I got, hey, this doesn't work. I can't load the native library. What, what does this error mean? We probably could have thrown up a, a better error message, tr to be sure. But um, it, it, it was a real challenge. We came up with a solution to that for the .NET bindings. And in, in the Java bindings, you get a, um, you know, we embed it in the jar and extract it at runtime. But, it's so much easier with an executable. Um, the reasons for that are you know, different language bindings have different methods for interfa interfacing with native code, right? Java's got JNA, .NET has P invoke, uh, Python has C types. You know, you have different methods, and they all have slightly different semantics of how they interface with native code. For example, in the, uh, Ruby, we use a, a gem called FFI to interface with the, the, the native code and call the C code. Um, but uh, as far as I can tell, there's no way to unload the native library using FFI. I, if somebody wants to correct me on that, feel free. But there's no free library call uh, on Windows. And that's a real problem for supporting things like multiple instances of IE, which is one of the things we wanted to, 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 to solve for. Um, process management, on the other hand, launching a process and waiting for it to terminate and so on, is very well defined by every operating system out there. And all of the languages handle it very nicely uh, in, in ways of, you know, it's, it's very well encapsulated and supported by the OS, so it's much easier for the individual languages to support it. Um, 
It's also vastly easier to debug, right? I mean, debugging a, a standalone executable, especially on Windows, is, uh, with Visual Studio is really easy. You find the process in the process list and you attach the debugger to it. It's really easy to, really easy to do. A lot easier than uh, having to stop your Java code at a breakpoint and then fire up Visual Studio and then I got to go hunt up the Java process because it's in process with Java and figure out which Java process it is and then I got to debug that. What a nightmare. Oh man, I got to tell you. So, um, another reason to, launch a to use a standalone executable, you're not tied to the releases of Selenium. You don't have to wait for 2.21 to get a new feature out there. You can just release the executable and people can just download it and use it. And that leaves me one of the downsides of it is it's one more thing that users have to download. And I know that's a sticking point for some people. It's a sticking point for people with the Chrome driver uh, and so on and so on. But and you can't bundle an executable inside the jar or inside uh, .NET assembly very easily because just about every antivirus scanner out there just lives to see executable files show up in the temp directory and start to run. They, they love that and they, they, you know, they don't care for that very much. So um, a standalone executable that lives outside is separately downloadable and separately executable is a way to uh, to, to, to really in, embrace the native code, but not, uh, uh, but, and let it be uh, usable. So, how do you implement such a standalone server um, that language bindings can, can easily use? That's, that's the next question. So, that's lesson two. Lesson two, implement the JSON wire protocol. Um, and so what is this JSON wire protocol thing, right? What's that? Uh, it's, it's a protocol that uses JSON, and it's transmitted over HTTP uh, that a language binding can use to communicate with uh, a remote web driver server. Uh, quick show of hands, who's used remote web driver? Who's used grid? Guess what? You're using the JSON wire protocol under the covers. Um, so the protocol is documented in the project wiki. I've got the, there's another link later on in the presentation as you get the slides online afterwards. You can see it there. But um, implementing the protocol allows language bindings for specific browsers like Internet Explorer driver, Firefox driver, Chrome driver, and so on to subclass from remote web driver. Um, and uh, if they have such a construct or alternatively in some cases, expose the protocol to the user. It's a decision I don't particularly care for, but some, 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 uh, some bindings decide to do that. Um, if you decide to use C++, if you're building a driver for a specific browser and you decide to use C++, hey, there's already a, uh, a, a server component, that, because one of the downsides of using this is that your driver does have to implement a, uh, an HTTP server. But hey, in the project, there is a C++ HTTP server that already knows how to respond to all the endpoints of the JSON wire protocol. So you can leverage that too if you, if you get to the point where you want to automate a new browser somehow. But um, the biggest advantage there is um, it vastly simplifies what the language binding code looks like. Now, I know, is that really a big deal? Does that really matter that much? Well, let's take a quick look at that. So this slide right here shows what the, uh, the .NET binding C, C Sharp source code for the IE driver looked like before the rewrite landed in December 2010. Uh, sorry, the, the, the print is so small. I really wanted it to fit on one slide and I didn't want to click through you know, 10 or 12 of them really quickly. Um, so that's the code, except, um, no, wait, that, that's not all of it. Um, there's, there's more. Um, and so now you're seeing more of the code and, well, oh, wait, nope, that's not all of it still. There's still more. So this is the entirety of the Internet Explorer driver code, C Sharp code for the .NET bindings, uh, before the rewrite. Um, it's, uh, if you take out all of the comments and blank lines and import statements, it's 683 lines of code. Um, I'd, I'd like to think that it's not sloppy code. I mean, I was responsible for writing it, so I'd like to think it was pretty reasonably clean code and follows, you know, good programming practices, you're welcome to go back in the SVN history and take a look if you're really that interested. Um, but let's take a look at what after the rewrite it looked like. That's it. 
That's the entirety of the fully functional Internet Explorer driver after the rewrite where we could subclass remote web driver. It's uh, 32 lines of code. That's again with all the comments and the blank lines and import statements removed. 32 lines of code. It's less than 5% the size of the previous version. I mean, and, and it's not just .NET that shows this. All the other language bindings that we support, Python, Ruby, Java, they all experience similar levels of simplification just by implementing all of that hard work using a server side, using the remote web driver as the, as the background. Of course, now, full disclosure, this is a little bit of a cheat because this particular implementation doesn't do screenshots, but adding screenshot functionality in this actually does add only about five lines of actual code, so, you know, it just wouldn't fit on one slide, so, sorry guys. Now, if you think that implementing that entire protocol in your native code, in C++, 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 is for, your, for the browser that you're trying to implement, is a hard thing, is a lot of work. Well, it is. It is a lot of work. But uh, there are some things you can make, use to make it a little easier. And let me show you one of the ways you can make it a little easier. Use something called automation atoms. Um, now, what are automation atoms? Anybody ever heard the term automation atom? Show of hands. Okay, some, that's good. Okay, automation atoms are JavaScript functions that can be used by all browsers for automating functionality within a browser. Um, and they are, we, we have a whole set of these automation atoms that are already in the web driver source code. It's JavaScript code that gets compiled down to, uh, to, to, uh, and minified so that it's not huge um, and, and sent over to the browser. Now the reason we do that is it guarantees consistency of browser behavior. And what that means is that when you run this JavaScript code uh, in IE and in Firefox and in Chrome, you should get the same behavior. Take getting the text of an element, for example. That's a pretty common thing. We all do that, right? Everybody's got to need to get the text of an element. Nods, yes, no. Is anybody awake? Okay, there we go. Um, that's given the way that we spec out what should happen, the, the web driver project specs should happen when you get the text of an element, is not just a simple thing. It's a pretty complex thing. And in order to consistently make sure that we do the same behavior across browsers, we can use JavaScript to do that. And we do. Uh, incidentally, um, the IE driver relies on these automation apps for a fair bit of functionality, but that's one of the reasons that you'll see that it's a little bit slower than some of the other drivers. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but the JavaScript engine in IE 6, 7, and 8 is pretty bad when it comes to performance um, compared to those in Firefox and Chrome and you know, other browsers. Um, in IE 9, they rewrote the, 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 the JavaScript engine. It, is on a, getting to closer to a level, but it only works, or they only implemented it in 32-bit IE9. I don't understand that decision either. So 64-bit IE9 is still using the old, poor-performing JavaScript engine. So the point here is that in IE, we consciously decided to sacrifice performance for maintainability. The nice thing about um, the, the, the automation atoms is that being JavaScript, when you're developing them, if you need to make a change to them, you can make that development and, and test, or you can make that change and test that change right in your browser. You don't need to go through a whole build and launch some, some language binding and test. You can test it right there in the browser to make sure that it works the way you expect it to. So that makes it a lot more maintainable. Um, but in the case of IE, you may sacrifice performance for that maintainability. Um, now, remember I said JavaScript only implementations have some pitfalls? Well, let's look at some of those. Real quick, pop quiz time. Consider an HTML element that looks like this. It's basically a text box, or sorry, a button, an input button that when you click it, throws up an alert. Now, if you're calling webElement.click and your driver uses only JavaScript to process that, what's going to happen when, 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 when you click that? What's going to happen in your driver code? Or here's another, here's another example. It's a form with a submit, and on submit, you pop an alert. Uh, what's going to happen if you're using JavaScript to, to um, process that? Your test 
could halt or your, or your, your, your code could just stop uh, because you're executing JavaScript and an alert stops JavaScript performance or st JavaScript uh, execution. That's what it's supposed to do. That's what alerts are supposed to do. So if you depend on automation atoms for uh, exclusively or JavaScript exclusively for things like this, you could run into pitfalls. And before you start saying things like, um, well, you should just launch another thread and do it on another thread and do it that way. Um, when you're dealing with things like IE and COM objects, uh, that leads you down the path of using methods with names like co-marshal enter thread interface in stream or co-get interface and release stream and other nastiness that you just don't want to have to deal with. So using another thread like that is really not necessarily the best approach. Also, how do you make sure if you're using a JavaScript only approach, how do you make sure you're firing all the events on the DOM in the right order? You know, th that event firing stuff changes from browser to browser. It's not the same from browser to browser. And even from version to version of a single browser, it's not necessarily the same. What do you do, just trial and error? I mean, how do you approach that? Um, so that gives us, leads us down to what, what I call the fourth lesson, which is use what we call native events. Who's heard of native events? Anybody? Yeah, there you go. All right, so native events, they are operating system level mechanisms for clicking the mouse, moving the mouse, uh, processing keyboard events, and so on. And why would you want to do something silly like that? Well, it's actually closer to the user experience. If you, if you simulate to the browser by sending an OS level message that, that, it's, that it's getting a mouse click at a certain point, well, the browser is going to interpret it as having a mouse click. And it's going to fire all the events on all the elements, even the overlapped ones, that, that, that it should. Also, it won't do that whole modal dialog blocking thing like we were talking about earlier. So you throw an alert, hey, your code can continue on and handle the alert however you want it to. Um, that it is more difficult using native events than it is using just a JavaScript implementation. I will say that. Um, it's asynchronous by nature. So what that means is you fire that click and forget about it. So if you're clicking on a link that's going to load a new page, for example, uh, it's very hard to synchronize on that. Uh, you can make a best effort, make a best guess, but there's always going to be a race condition that you could lose and not be able to synchronize properly. That's one of the reasons that we don't guarantee synchronicity on webelement.click and, and loading a new page. That's why we don't guarantee that. We make a best effort, but we may not be able to synchronize on that page load. Um, another challenge in using native events is that um, there, are, there are a lot of goals to the WebDriver project. Uh, but one of them is first to mimic the user experience as closely as possible. We talked about that. Native events explicitly support that goal. Another goal is we don't want you to have to have the, 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 the browser in the foreground. We want you to be able to continue to use your machine for other things while your test is running or while your code is running. Uh, and, and those can sometimes be diametrically opposed. Um, so even using um, native events, sometimes you can run into problems where when the browser doesn't have focus, it doesn't work exactly as you want it to. Let's take an example. Um, let's suppose that you're automating IE. And the IE window that you're automating is not the one in the foreground. You've got another window in front of it. And you send a click to an element on that page. Um, what you can sometimes see is it'll look like there's a focus rectangle around the link in the background, as you can see it up there, but it doesn't actually process the click, the click and navigate to the new page. That's a problem with native events. So there are ways that you could potentially say, let's use, um, let's, let's make the window that we're interacting with have the focus, but then how do you do things like synchronize between two different instances and make sure that the instance that you want is having the foreground? You've got some complex locking issues that you have to deal with if you're supporting multiple instances. Um, another challenge, sometimes the browser can behave in you know, unexpected ways. Here, here's another example. Who, who's, who's tried to hover over events with IE? Hover over elements, I mean, hover over elements. Had problems with it? Yeah, see if this looks familiar. Uh, you have a menu that appears, you write your code in using the actions class, the menu flashes and disappears, and you just frustration. Yeah. Um, on Windows, native events are handled using Windows messages. A um, little technical stuff ahead. Um, when IE receives a WM mouse move message, uh, inside its message loop, when it processes that, 
it, uh, it fires another message to itself that says, hey, where's the physical mouse cursor? And if the physical mouse cursor is within the bounds of the IE window, it, uh, it, it redraws everything and, and makes everything uh, different, uh, you know, based on where the actual physical mouse cursor is. So that's why we've often said, hey, the workaround is make sure your physical mouse cursor is outside the, the, the bounds of the, of the physical IE window when you're running using uh, mouse hovers. Uh, but that's a problem with, with one of the problems with associated with native events that you can, that you can use. Now, there are way, we're, we're still looking for a good workaround for that. Um, uh, it, it's the way IE works. It's the cost of doing business with IE. Um, maybe a way around it is to implement a don't use native events mode for IE. We're not entirely sure how to handle that yet. But um, so that's the... Um, that's the, the source of that particular frustration. Believe me, I feel your pain. Everybody, everybody wants to see that problem solved, and we haven't found a good way to solve it yet. So um, that's lesson four, use native events. Uh, moving on to the fifth and final lesson, uh, log everything. Just to preserve your sanity. Write out a log file for everything. Now, incidentally, this is something we don't do in the IE driver, which is one of the reasons that my hairline is where it is. Um, if you're looking for a place that you really want to get involved in the project, and, I, and I, believe me, I would love to see some volunteers who are willing to help out, um, help me implement uh, some comprehensive logging with the IE driver. Uh, we don't do it today, and it's really a source of, uh, a source of pain and, and confusion for, for, um, for, for things. One, one place where it would help, for example, who, who's, who's ever run into an, uh, 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 an exception that says uh, you must set the protected mode property to, uh, to the same value for all, for all zones? Who's ever run into that, that exception? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about it now. There's a very good and specific reason why we, we, we throw that exception, and that's our exception. We do that. That's Selenium that does that. There's a good and, and, and sufficient reason. Happy to talk about it offline. But... Um, the, um, but if we had some logging that we were actually writing out to a log file or writing out even to the console, it would help us to diagnose the, the reasons behind why that exception is, is, is coming up. Because sometimes you ask people, well, are, have you done this? And they say, well, yeah, I've done it. And, it's, and, and they still, it's still getting the exception. Or they see the exception on Windows XP. And that, um, and that should never happen. It should never happen on Windows XP because there's no such thing as protected on XP. So um, that is uh, pretty much the bulk of, of, of what, I, what I wanted to, to, to get at. Um, you know, uh, going, going back, log everything, use native events, uh, use the automation atoms, um, uh, implement, uh, use native, native code where you can, or a browser, uh, an independent language uh, for your browser-specific stuff, and, uh, and implement the JSON wire protocol. Those are the, the five big lessons. If you ever ne find yourself needing to automate a browser, those are the lessons that I would like to leave you with. I've got a few resources here. There's some, just some interesting things. Uh, again, these slides will be posted uh, online, so you, you don't have to feel like you have to scribble them down right now. But there's some discussions from the developer's email list uh, of when, when the whole uh, rewrite the IE driver was coming about and uh, its interesting history in the project. Uh, there's the wiki... Uh, wiki article on the uh, wire protocol and on the automation atoms. And uh, that's the bulk of the content of my presentation. And I've got about two and a half minutes left if you have questions that I can answer. Hello? Hello? Yes. Um, yeah, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Well, the first one you were talking about that in order to implement this driver, you can either use JavaScript or native events. In the current solution you guys are working, how, what's the percentage of its implement, each implementation or are you just using native events? What's the percentage of native of, events in each implementation of the, of the browser, of, of browser drivers? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking. Yeah. Um, well, native events are, 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 I believe, fully implemented on, on IE and Firefox. Now, uh, for Firefox on Linux, they are not turned on by default. Is that still the case? Yeah. So you're not running with native events, but it is an option that you can set for Firefox on Linux. Uh, on OS X, we do not have native events implemented yet. That's still in progress. 
Uh, IE only speaks native events. It does not speak simulated events at this point. There's, there's, there's no way to turn them off at this point. Um, for, the, for the mobile browsers, things are a little different. Uh, uh, they, they don't really have a sort of a native events kind of thing. They, they rely much more on JavaScript. And the new Safari driver that just landed recently doesn't use native events either. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, in, are you guys focusing on just the latest version of Internet Explorer? Or, or yeah, you, because one thing I found, you know, useful lately is that even for other testing purposes, that for example, the latest Internet Explorer version, it does have internally uh, like a different running mode to be compatible with other, you know, Internet Explorer ones. Uh, so are you guys taking advantage of that feature or, or not really? In general, we run, in general we, 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 we run our, we, we have a set of tests for, for the browsers in the project. And for IE, we run those tests actually on IE 6, 7, 8, and 9 at the moment. We actually run it. We don't, we don't have a good way at the moment. IE doesn't really expose a good way to programmatically set the render mode. So to go say, treat this as IE 8. There's not a good COM method that you can use. We use the COM uh, interfaces for, IE, for Internet Explorer uh, to automate it in the most part. And they don't really expose a good way to flip that bit. So instead, what we actually do is we actually run it on the, on the actual browsers, 6, 7, 8, and 9 at this point. And 10 will be forthcoming when it's actually released. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very interesting thing because, I mean, for, for some... Yeah, I mean, for, for some cross browser testing thing, I mean, we're doing something similar, mm -hmm. but we ended up using shortcuts in order to get there, you know, in order to yeah. be quick. But, uh, right. For this kind Virtual of machines. Yeah. Virtual machines are our friend. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Yes. I had a quick question about the uh, .NET bindings. Sure. Uh, are they supported with Mono completely at all? Uh, I ran them once with Mono. Okay. That Does that count? I mean, that explains I, what I'm seeing. Then. They, <laughs> haven't, they, haven't, they haven't been run in some time, and I, it's one of those things that I keep meaning to get back to and just okay. haven't had a chance to get back okay. to it yet. There, there's no reason why they shouldn't work. There's nothing in there that's, that's, that, that can't be worked around and fixed. I'll put it that way. Okay, I'll log. I, I'm happy to work with you offline on yeah. that. Yeah. Got a question? Uh, Jim, is there a known issue with an IE and uh, consistency in terms of uh, test passing? We're finding that with our application, you run the same test 10 times on Chrome, Firefox, it passes. IE, we're looking at maybe 5 out of 10 times. Um, is there a best practices or should we just say IE is just an issue? I mean, what's, what is the problem there? Well, it depends, on what you're, it, depends on, it depends on what you're doing in your test, really. I mean, because native events are going to be a lot flakier than just doing stuff with JavaScript, right? Um, uh, so, and, and IE, as, as, as we talked about, IE has problems with some native event stuff, uh, particularly with browser focus and where the cursor happens to be on the screen at the time. So, um, you know, some of the best practices you can do is, I don't know what language you work in, but in, in Java there's a robot class that you can use to actually move the cursor off to the to zero, zero on the screen, which will help. Or in .NET, it's uh, uh, cursor.mouse.position or something like that that you can move off to the to zero zero. That will help. Um, um, uh, making sure that the, that you have nothing else open on the screen at the time, uh, you know, because the browser focus does matter with IE. Um, it doesn't matter as much with some of the other browsers, but it matters a lot with IE uh, because we're completely out of process with IE. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had uh, any interaction or help uh, with Microsoft and the IE team. Uh, we have we've approached them several times, and we, we have a, a, a working relationship with them. My my ultimate dream goal is I would love to see the I, the, the the IE team at Microsoft take over the native IE driver. That is my long term dream. I would wish for that. I want them to. I want I, uh, IE driver server .exe to come from them, not from the Selenium project. That is long term what I would like to see. Um, at the same time, we've had the, 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 the corporate culture in Microsoft, at Microsoft, especially in the IE division, um, there, there's, there's, there has been historically some resistance to working with open source projects. So it, there's a little contention there. We, we, we've reached out to them several times, and we have a, a, a working relationship with them. Anything else? 
Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate your time and attention. Jim, um, for those of you who are here and feeling a little bit peckish or thirsty, we've got a short break now. Um, I think you may find the deliberate mistake in the program at this point. Um, if you don't, then you know probably you should be a software developer rather than a tester. Um, we're going to be reconvening again at 11:35, so um, I'll see you all very soon.